So I am Dali Chanazan. I'm leading the research team at Amaros. Also, I'm lecturing at the Evans State University. So today I will talk about some multidisciplinary. I will have a multidisciplinary talk. It's the right at the intersection of machine learning, let's say statistical machine learning and healthcare, and more specifically clinical trials. In our company, we are working uh, in a task related to this. But the talk is constructed uh, based on different papers. So we are going to go from disease to disease because there were no just one big paper that was talking about everything. So, mm -hmm. so today we are going to talk about disease heterogeneity, subtyping, uh, clinical trials, how those are connected clinical trials design and trial enrichment with the subtyping with some machine learning models. So the main problem that all this is coming from is that there are a lot of diseases and some of them are written here. For example, car cardiovascular, neurodegenerative, and autoimmune, mainly autoimmune. Those are heterogeneous diseases. That means that there are different subgroups who are answering to the disease differently. What does that mean? I'm usually how I'm explaining this part that let's imagine there is one disease, let's say, I don't know, some cancer type. Uh, in reality, that disease is a combination of multiple diseases. Why? Because if that disease is, uh, let's say, attacking to some person, differently than to some group of people differently than to the others. That means it's kind of a different disease. So the, okay, let's, let's look to this graph. So let's look, for example, typical decision progression trajectory for some disease. So time, diagnosis point, and this is burden for, for, for the time. But as I was explaining, so, there are different subgroups of people who are, for example, this, uh, let's imagine we are giving to some drug, some treatment to the first subgroup of the, uh, to some, to the first subgroup of that, of some people, let's say. So there are, there are kind of short-term responders, uh, responders to the treatment. That means if you can see, it goes down and again, it goes up afterward. But for the second, subgroup of the people, they are non-responders. That means this is burden is going up and up throughout the time without going any down. So the, all those, all whatever I described are the source why people started to think about this is subtyping and trying to solve such problem, finding that this is sub characteristics of the different disease subgroups. Okay, so I have taken one paper about asthma. This is the first data-driven subtyping that has been done. It was in 2008 with the easiest like ML methods. Let's just take and understand how it works and we'll go for it. So asthma is five to 10% of the people with severe asthma, but they never get a treatment that works for them. What are the main, so there is one paper which describes all these processes, etc. What are the main things that we want to answer about asthma? What are the processes, genetic or environmental, that underlie the different subtypes? And I should mention, it's important not for me, that, that subtypes are already known for the asthma, the different subtypes, those are known. What are the best uh, biomarkers that will describe the disease progression for each subgroup of that people and how to find out different therapies for each subgroup? So, uh, they have done some study. They had different uh, data sets, three different ones. The first one is 180 something patients from pi primary care. So what is important to note here, primary care is kind of family doctor. That means those patients mostly are not severe. Are, they don't have severe uh, uh, asthma. 
The second one, we should see that 180 something from, again, UK uh, refractory asthma clinic. That means those patients have severe asthma. And the third one is very different from the second two. This is clinical trial patients, like just 68. That means we have different uh, populations of people with having asthma. Okay, let's look to the data. We uh, primary care, secondary care, and uh, the clinical trial one. So we have some 20 features. It goes from the sex, age, age of onset. And uh, we can look here to the number of sputum A or something count. The sputum is very, uh, when you have some uh, severe problem related to your airways or lungs, there is something they are counting in the sputum. Sputum in Armenia is took. Uh, so you can see, for example, the first one, first primary care, for the primary case, just 1.3, and for the secondary case, it's 0.29. It also one, it, this is also one indication that for the second uh, day, uh, data set, we have uh, more severe patients in the second data set. Let's go forward. They just did, for the primary care, just a simple K-means clustering. Uh, let's look to the data. For example, the, the, they found three clusters. Uh, for the first one, we can see that in a difference to the, sec the second and third, uh, we have younger patients. Uh, no, asthma started at younger age, sorry. And if we look to this data, we can see that uh, a number of admissions to the hospital during the last one year, uh, so is just 1.04, and for, for example, for the second cluster, it's just 0 0.2. That means kind of, again, those, yeah, whoever got the asthma, they had been diagnosed as, with asthma uh, at uh, younger ages, they, are, they have much more severe, and it's, uh, the first cluster represents to this, this patient. And we can see here some other ones, for example, the. Uh, in the first cluster, there are 80% females. Body mass index is higher than the other clusters. And uh, for the third one, we can see that it's very light version of asthma for this benign, uh, uh, for the third group. Let's go forward. They did some, cl the, the same, like easy clustering on the secondary care data. What they got, they got four clusters. What they understood after analysis, the, the first uh, two clusters resembles exactly the same clusters from the first day, like primary care clustering. Uh, and what we, uh, they have found out that the third and fourth cluster are, are kind of representing the first class, third cluster from the first uh, that clustering. What it, uh, th th this gave them baseline to go forward and to test this method to do scratch uh, let's say inference in the second, in the third data set. Uh, the third data set is clinical trial data, how we know, well, how I told. So it randomized controlled trial, they are giving it to some drug and placebo, and the outcome is some, again, some number in sputum. In the original study, uh, they found out, as a result of the clinical trial, that this cortisol, that something is not working, the treatment. But this could be, could, be, could be explained by the heterogeneity of the disease. So let's go to see the results after doing some clustering, that clustering to the third one. So we can see that for the first, Sec, we can see, like, for the whole group of people, these numbers are the same. One plus nine, zero, six, two, two. Kind of the same, or exactly the same. It's exactly the same. That means there is no treatment effect, so you, but the treatment is not helping. But we are, when we are looking to the second and third ones, we are getting much more information about the treatment effect for particularly those subgroups. 
For the first one, we cannot say anything. It's not highlighted here. Why? Because there are sm very small number of patients. So this is some easy clustering method has been applied and it, like, uh, it, it shows that it helps for uh, uh, Free are, yes, abyss, the first, second, and third. For the second and third clusters, we see like exact difference. But when we see, when we look to the whole uh, population, there is no difference between the, getting the treatment and the, the other one, placebo. Okay, so you have different uh, ratio for the second cluster, the second column is higher. Uh -huh. For the first cluster, the first column is higher. That means, for example, for some of this, one of these clusters, that treatment is helping. The other one is clearly you shouldn't give. I don't know which one because this number is hard to understand, sputum number something. But there is a big difference. For, example, for one cluster, you should give the treatment. For the another, you should never give that treatment for, to the patient. Uh -huh. So this clustering was done on this clinical trial data or other data? Other two. Other data. When they got kind of the same cluster, they understood they can take the uh, like method to the first one and test something like that. Okay. Let's, so these subtyping applications, for example, re reduce uncertainty in individuals' treatment uh, decisions, etc. One application. The second one, to forecast the expected costs, etc. about the treatment planning. And, all those three are kind of connected, but we'll, I will specifically call, go to the third one, which is improving effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of the clinical trials by enabling targeted recruitment. So let's go to see how these uh, clinical trials are usually working, what's the process, and what, uh, let's discuss one statistical ML paper that kind of does that and kind of helps. Let's see. So. How usually clinical trials are working? We have the sponsor. We start, let's imagine we have that molecular part are done. We have the drug. We want to test in different uh, number of patients for different phases of clinical trials. There are usually different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, 100, 500, and thousands of patients. So they are designing the criteria. They are designing the trial and Part of the trial design is uh, designing inclusion and exclusion criteria. Those inclusion and exclusion criteria are acting as a, like eligibility criteria to find for the recruitment of the patients. What's the main idea to recruit? Uh, what we want to recruit patients uh, that will enable us to understand the real effect of the drug. But uh, we want to recruit enough patients to understand that effect because if we have less or non-representative, uh, some problems may occur. Uh, how it usually works, that criteria are based on different types of data of, about the patients. Uh, I will start from the bottom, like images. Imaging, there, there are different modality of images that some uh, information should be extracted. EHR data, this is mainly clinical, uh, clinical data, by saying clinical, I mean all the diagnosis, procedures, doctor notes, family history, medications, and a lot of such stuff about the patient. Genetics data and claims data. Claims data is usually the insurance data. Why we need insurance? It's uh, because whenever something has been done, for example, diagnosis has been done to the patient, uh, the doctors are uh, writing that appropriate codes, sending appropriate codes to the insurance to get a pro uh, needed money from them, in the US specifically. So that code helps us to combine that with the clinical data, diagnosis information from the EHR, and to have richer uh, representation. Why? Because usually there are a lot of mistakes done in the EHR. It's very unclean data. Afterward, what's happening? We are identifying the pa uh, eligible patients based on that criteria. We are doing screening, pre-screening, and randomization and clinical trials. So you can see that the number of patients are going down afterward. Okay, so let's go forward. There are a lot of trials failing. 
starting from 2003, there is data, there are thousands of trials failing. That can be, the, the, uh, the reason can, the, the, there can be different reasons, wrong timing, uh, wrong people, that means subtypes, uh, insufficient duration, duration, insensitive endpoints, that means endpoints are, or the hypothesis was wrong. But again, we'll concentrate on the subtyping because this is a very big problem. Uh, and a lot of trials are failing because of not giving to the right population of the people. And a lot of trials are not failing. There have been cases they went to the market and people died because of that. So this is some quote taken from some paper that has been studying, again, this uh, criteria design, why they are failing, what are the failure rates, etc. cetera. Uh, very known guy, this James, head of a lot of things at Stanford. He told, it was certainly surprising to us that these clinical trial designs are fairly ad hoc and quite anecdotal. So this, uh, when we are talking to some investors who are who don't know a lot about field, we are uh, showing this quote because it helps. So there are two enrichment examples that uh, uh, papers has been uh, published. And the first one is testing whether donabazil is some treatment. Uh, ah, yes, it's approved symptomatic t treatment for dementia. Could slow progression from MSI to dementia. MSI is mild cognitive impairment. It's some, that uh, neurodegenerative disease has some stages. It's one of that stages, early stages. So, so the study result was that placebo control the double uh, mind, that phase three study found no significant treatment effect. That means the drug is not working. But there is one paper that uh, they are doing some statistical machine learning things there. They are saying considerable heterogeneity in the CI, MCI, masked the potential treatment effect in a sample of more severely impaired late stage MSI participants. That means the heterogeneity, uh, they did, uh, the clinical trial design was not good enough and they, they didn't go inside, let's say, more deep to the disease to understand the heterogeneity, the, the different subtypes, subgroups, and to create, per, to at least to analyze for specific subgroups. And they found out that in that case, if you are working on some subtyping, etc., that could help to understand much more about the treatment effect. And the second one about which we will talk much deep, more deeply here today is, again, is this, that donabazil. Uh, comparison of 23 milligram donabazil to 10 milligram donabazil in patients with moderate to severe Alzheimer disease. So the, of course, as a, uh, the, study, the study result, what they found, which one is better or something like that, but in, as a result, uh, the paper result is there is an opportunity to refine eligible criter eligibility criteria that can better predict participants who are likely to develop SI. SI is serious adverse events. That means you don't want to give the drug to a patient who will die afterward because of some side effects, for example. Let's go. This is the name of the uh, paper and the link. So why I took this one, not the other one? Because it's just a nature paper. Let's just look something uh, from different things, like probabilistic topic modeling. What it's about, let's imagine we have text. We are trying, in unsupervised manner, we are trying to find out the words and uh, categorize them under some topics. Why it was important in a field to, for the annotation, for example, for the, of the texts. Now let's imagine there are clinical events 
that adverse events that can happen to a patient. For example, I don't know, a lot of clinical events. We'll go and look by name by name. We want to categorize them under different clinical topics. And let's go forward to see. How does, uh, what was the study about, like research about? We are taking observational data from some database. It's called One Florida. They are taking uh, demographic diagnosis, medications data, and they are trying to cluster the, find different clusters of patients that have similar characteristics. Uh, also, to understand if that, to predict if uh, which, which of the clusters will have at least one serious adverse event. And after that, based on that characteristics of that groups, to analyze the characteristics of the groups that will have serious adverse events and refine the exclusion criteria based on that characteristics. Is that clear? Because if the people will have serious adverse events, we don't want uh, them to be in the clinical trials, not to die, at least. Uh, okay, so this is the process. Let's, whatever I was telling, like clinical events. For example, clinical event is schizophrenia. Clinical event is anti-allergic something. Some allergy, for example, happens. Some, let's, we can, in easier words, we can say some diseases. Events happening to the patient. For example, the, before there were no schizophrenia, the patient now, after, uh, as a result of taking the drug during the clinical trial, has schizophrenia. How the model works. So they took that idea of probabilistic topic modeling. They, uh, the clinical events here will act as that word. And what they want, at the, at the first layer, they want to do some uh, probabilistic clustering uh, in an unsupervised manner, of course. That uh, will, we can say, will refine the pi patient representation, data representation. And also, during that time, uh, we can say that they want patients who will have clinical events that are uh, represented in the same clinical topic to be kind of similar. Is this clear? Because, for example, the schizophrenia and, uh, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, schizophrenia and this anti-holinergic something are kind of, sim they have similarities and they are under the same clinical topic. They want the patients who will develop clinical events of this clinical topic to be kind of similar. Uh, and during that process, they are, uh, it was unsupervised learning. They are doing Poisson factor analysis there. Uh, they are adding supervised setting. They are changing that unsupervised to supervised uh, setting. How? Uh, they are, uh, it was simple elbow maximization. They are adding to that the super, uh, what was the name? They are adding the information about SI. The label will, will the patient will have at least one serious adverse event or not. So they are optimizing the summation. Definition of serious adverse events, they are taking from FDA and something that definitions, how the definitions works. So how the, usually the things works, that we have target population, study population, the patients who are eligible, and we have patients who are enrolled in the study. So at first, before doing any clustering and setup, they are, they are uh, 
they are adding that uh, medications, diagnosis, like let's say patient information, and uh, with the UMAP, they are looking to the distribution. We can see that psi and uh, psi is zero, there is no psi, any adverse event, and uh, more than zero, there is at least one psi happened to the patient. We can see there, there, uh, from the distribution, there is no any difference between the groups. What happened? After the clustering, whatever I mentioned, they are getting another representation with that supervised manner, and they are doing clustering. There is an exact difference between the patients of psi and non-psi, let's say. Those are different clinical topics. The red ones are the ones that are uh, affecting, like psi. Uh, there, there is a serious adverse event, and the blue ones are for the non-psi groups, the clinical uh, topics of that one, the greens are not, like they found out, not related to these uh, patients, to this clinical study. And the most important part here, so on the right are related, ex like exclusion criteria in the original clinical study. On the left, they found, they are writing topics, and they found some relation in the real world exclusion criteria, and the ones that they, they build exclusion criteria. I will just look at the first one. What it tells, we can look to the, this T1. It's gastrointestinal something. Sorry. Okay. On the, second, on the right part, we can see it just says active gastrointestinal something. If we go and we look to the T1 and 2, sorry. T1 and T17, we can see how detailed information we have. Both of them are different clinical topics, but the clinical events under that clinical topics are uh, related to that gastrointestinal something. So what we found out, that they were able to give much more detailed information to exclude patients. That means to uh, have smaller amount of patients who will have, as a result of the trial, some serious adverse event. That means, for example, die. Uh, so they just look to the effectiveness. They look safety part of the clinical trial. There can be different uh, enrichment strategies. And the most important thing that I want to say, all the trials, all the papers that they are doing right now has one limitation. What is the limitation? If you have longitudinal data, and we'll finish after this one. If you have longitudinal data in observational, uh, from observational world, let's say observational data, not clinical trial, that means that those data, uh, data points are not aligned. What does that mean? That Sometimes you don't know the diagnosis of the patient exact when it has been diagnosed. Of course, you know the diagnosis that patient, uh, doctor has been done, but you don't know real onset. So that means you are going to align different patient data wrongly, and it's going to affect to your, let's say, that subtyping, subgrouping, and clustering. Here comes the new buzzword generative models that are helping to this problem. But thank you. Uh, so uh, I want to ask about the like, first part of your presentation, mm -hmm. where you talked about like, the heterogeneity of diseases uh, and subtypes. So uh, as I understand, like, uh, there, there might be a clinical trial which would fail, basically, like, uh, for some people, this trial will work, some people it might fail, right? And uh, the reason it might fail is not because doesn't work at all because of the, the mix of uh, subtypes in the population, right? So, like, one could uh, take these results and, uh, like, take, uh, take uh, people, like, who, who, they, who the drug worked for and the versus who did, did, didn't work, and then maybe, like, create some kind of classifier, right? So, like, use all the features, and then, like, build a new randomized control trial, which will only, uh, you will only uh, have people who will uh, be classified as eligible. Right. Does that make sense? Like, so uh, the main, uh, what I told here as a main result, that we, should, we are refining the eligibility criteria. That means whoever has been hired for the trial were wrong. We shouldn't hire most, 
like most or some of those people, we should hire different ones. That means the trial is itself is changing. So yes, you can get some insights from the trial data, but uh, if you want to refine and to get better results, you should hire different pe people. I mean, so I mean to hire different people. Uh -huh. but, uh, to select these different people by uh, insights you get from this trial. So basically, you, you build something classified. I got what you mean. Yes. So, for example, now there are some things called the digital twins. Uh, uh, I killed Ferran's brain with the digital twins. Sometimes I was telling it's good idea, good idea. Uh, the what's the idea? There is control group and treatment group. The main idea of the digital twins is to slow, uh, based on the historical patient clinical trials uh, data. To understand what will, be, what will be the effect of the treatment group for this trial and to reduce the number of control group people. The same idea can work, for example, these dopenazil style things, if it's the same drug. What happened here in this study, in this paper? What was the interesting part? That there is a trial data, they didn't touch the trial data, they had observational data and they brought the idea and tested it on the, in the real world observational data. That can work, but the main problem is, so if you have the historical clinical trials, you can use that data. If no, that means you should work with the observational data. What they did in this paper, just they took the, only the patients, it's written right away, that they could align that longitudinal part. But usually we are coming to this problem whatever its limitation, when you want to do observational, because usually we have smaller amount, a small amount of patients, small amount of data, and you want to use everything, whatever you have, not to adjust and align, something like that. I just want to comment about uh, subtypes of diseases used in clinical trials. I think that uh, pre-disease pre uh, classification is more important before going to clinical trials. I mean uh, such groups or subtypes as uh, molecular alterations, tissue degeneration, cell dysfunctions, all these groups or subtypes, uh, using the several biomarkers for that groups, uh, could be used before going to the clinical trials with subtypes of all diseases in clusters you may. Exactly, so my third one was about that as a key takeaway. So this is subtyping can, uh, can help us to have some quantitative results to inform uh, the pharma companies. But what's the main problem here? That pharma companies to, uh, wants, to have as, wants to have drugs that will attract as much, as big uh, population of people as possible. So that's why that guy was, Stanford was telling that they are doing anecdotal criteria designs. But from our own experience, we found one pharma, <laughs> or they found us, that uh, they are young, they are, uh, they are young, and they want to use some of these kind of machine learning, etc. things to understand that subtypes. Why? They want to create drugs, and they already did, for two different subtypes of one eye disease. Uh, that two drugs have clearly different pathways. It requires much more money, but it, it is a generic solution, much, much more generic solution. And uh, anyways, something like that. And we are helping them to the, for that subtype. So the main, uh, 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 the main point here is that pharma companies doesn't want to do that because they are gonna lose money, most probably. They want to do something in the middle that will help or not that much, but it will slight, be slightly better than the, their competitive pharmas. I know some story, sorry for the long answer. Uh, I know some story that uh, what they did, there is 50 to 70 age for some clinical trial that their competitor did, that means that drug is gonna work for that particular uh, age people. What they did, they told, let's do 10 years higher, we will have more patients. 
They didn't do any subtyping like molecular pathways and those hard things, the analysis, etc. They want to get <laughs> more patients to buy their drug. That's all. So, well, that is, uh, thank you.